This begins our discussion on chemical equilibrium. You might remember from intro that chemical equilibrium is a pretty fun topic, and it is the state where the concentrations of all the reactants and products remain constant with time. On the molecular level, there's lots of things happening, but overall, it doesn't look like anything is happening. It's as if um, if we had 10 people in a classroom and five people left and five people from the hallway came in and it kept happening, then if we were looking at the classroom level, people were moving in and out constantly. But if we were looking at the overall reaction, there'd still be 10 people in the classroom. So that's what it means by on the molecular level, there's frantic activity and um, equilibrium is not static but highly dynamic situation. So again, it's macroscopically static. That means in the big picture, it's really not moving at all. But microscopically, it's dynamic. It is moving and changing. Here's an example of a situation of equilibrium. You notice we have um, two situations happening. It looks like as the concentration of NH3 increases, the concentration of H2 and N2 decrease. So it's almost like a synthesis reaction. Hydrogen and nitrogen would come together to form ammonia gas. Well, of course, in the beginning, we have lots of hydrogen, as you can see here, and we have lots of ammonia, um, nitrogen, but we don't have any zero ammonia because the reaction hasn't started yet. And then over time, as the hydrogen and nitrogen are used up, they decrease, and the amount of ammonia increases. Eventually, there comes a place where, because these reactions go in two directions, um, we have a situation called equilibrium, where the re ratio between the reactants and the products remain the same. And you can see there, indeed, is the equation for that particular reaction. The concentrations reach levels where the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction, and that is what equilibrium is. It doesn't necessarily mean the concentrations are equal, it means the rate is equal, um, and therefore the ratio between the reactants and products remain the same. And here's a graph showing that. So consider an equilibrium mixture in a closed vessel reacting according to this equation water plus carbon dioxide yields hydrogen and carbon dioxide gas, or carbon monoxide, pardon me, yields um, hydrogen and carbon dioxide gas. You add more water to the flask. How does the concentration of each chemical compare to its original concentration after equilibrium is reestablished? So let's think about that. If we have more hydrogen, that's going to shift the equilibrium to the right because you will notice if we have more reactant, and let's say that was the limiting reactant, and we get more of it, we can produce more products. So more hydrogen and CO2 will be produced as a result. Let's think of this situation. Again, the same reaction, but you add more H2 to the flask. How does the concentration of each chemical compare to its original after equilibrium is reestablished? All right. So we have more H2, and that would allow the reaction to move to the left because you'd have more of that reactant, which looks like a product now, but nonetheless it could, could be considered a reactant. It would shift to the left and produce more hydrogen and carbon monoxide, which would effectively, eventually, reduce the amount of hydrogen and the concentration of CO2 in the end. Remember the following reaction. This is how to find the concentration, or the K value, I should say, the ratio between the reactants and products. Remember, it is the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. So this is a shorthand way to write it, but if you write it, you can see here's the reaction. A plus B yields C plus D. The J, K, L, and M are the coefficients. A, B, C, and D are the actual substances. Square brackets, remember, mean concentration, and that will mean molarity. 
and J, K, L, and M are the coefficients. And the ratio between those things is considered K. That value of K, remember, doesn't have any units. So what can we figure out about the equilibrium constant? Well, the equilibrium expression for a reaction is the reciprocal of that for the reaction written in the reverse. So if we see a reaction and we write it in the backwards direction, then it's the inverse of that. Because it's always products over reactants. When balanced equation for the reaction is multiplied by a factor of n, the equilibrium expression for the new reaction is the original expression raised to the nth power. So, let's say we double a reaction, then it's going to be the k to the n power, which in this case is 2. k values are usually written without units. Alright, other information about k. k always has the same value at a given temperature regardless of the amounts of reactants or products that are present initially. In other words, sometimes things are not used up fully. For a reaction at a given temperature, there are many equilibrium positions but only one value for K. Equilibrium position is a set of equilibrium concentrations that has to get that special ratio. Now, in intro we talked about K or sometimes the books will call it K sub C, K with a little c. Um, but you can also achieve equilibrium with pressure. This is new. K involves concentration, Kp involves pressure. So here's an example um, where you, you could use Kc, it would be fine, or K, um, products over reactants. Um, and this, however, is showing gases reacting. You notice if we write it like this one, you can see that Kp equals the pressure of NH3 squared. And you might think, well, why is it squared? Remember, the coefficient becomes the exponent. Divided by the pressure of N2 times the pressure of H2 to the third power. And again, notice the 3. Also notice the square bra uh, the um, rounded brackets. The rounded brackets imply pressure. And units of pressure, like atmospheres or kilopascals, are used for that. Here is how you would write the same exact expression if you were talking about concentrations. And you might, in fact, be able to do that here as well, because you could find the molarity of these species. In this case, you have NH3 squared over N2 times H2 to the third power. So the square brackets imply molarity, and the rounded brackets imply pressure. Same exact idea. So let's look at this example using the same equation. Equilibrium pressures at a certain temperature are, uh, for NH3 it's 2.9 times 10 to the negative 2 atmospheres, for N2 it's 8.9 times 10 to the negative 1 atmospheres, and for H2 it's 2.9 times 10 to the negative 3. So the question is going to be, most likely, what is the value of Kp? So this is how you get it. Of course you should always write the equilibrium expression, products over reactants. This is shown here. And then you substitute in with the numbers they gave you. Squaring and cubing were appropriate. And when you work it out, you get 3.9 times 10 to the fourth. That's how you find Kp. Now, how do we go between K and Kp? Well, if you're given concentration, you just do products over reactants. Or, you can, if you know the pressure, the Kp, you can get the K using this formula right here, which you can find on your cheat sheet. Kp equals K times RT to the delta N. Delta N is the sum of the coefficients of the gaseous products minus the sum of the coefficients of the gaseous reactants. And of course R is 0 0.0821 and temperature is in Kelvin. So you notice here for delta N, products minus reactants, um, you have to add up the coefficients. The reactants would have four as the number of moles of reactants, and 2 as the number of moles of products. So that's going to be helpful in a minute when we solve. So using the value of Kp, which we got earlier, um, 3.9 times 10 to the 4, we're going to calculate the value of K at 35. So let's put it in. So there's the Kp we have. We're going to solve for K. 
uh, plug in R and T, and you notice the delta N is 2 minus 4. Remember how we got it, the number of products minus number of reactants that are gases. Now if sometimes you have reactants or products that are not gases, you can't use that or you don't count those number of moles. In this case, um, you notice it's going to be a negative exponent. In any case, when you solve for K, you get the number 2.5 times 10 to the 7th power. Heterogeneous equilibria and homogeneous equilibria. Pretty straightforward. Homogeneous equilibria involve the same phase of matter, like the one we just saw. So notice the gases are reactants and there's a gaseous product. Here's another example. Um, when something's aqueous and it breaks into ions, that's also considered homogeneous. These kinds of equilibria tend to occur quickly because the phase of matter remains the same. Heterogeneous equilibria involve more than one phase. So for example, here we have potassium chlorate breaking down into a solid and a gas. Obviously these are different phases of matter and that's why it's called heterogeneous. Same here, water liquid breaking down into its gaseous components, obviously through electrolysis, but notice um, they have different phases of matter, and that's just called heterogeneous equilibria. Equilibria, however, can be achieved with any of those things. Now, the position of a heterogeneous equilibrium does not depend on the amount of pure solids or liquids present. So in the previous reactions that we saw, we would actually just count them as one. They're there, but they have no influence on that. The concentration of pure liquids and solids are constant. So here's a good example here. Notice if we did products minus reactants, this species and this species are both solids and they wouldn't count. So therefore, the value of K is only dependent on the concentration of oxygen raised to the third power. And again, you can see it's why it's raised to the third power. And then finally, in this little section, the extent of a reaction. The value of K much larger than 1 means that equilibrium will lie to the right, mostly products, because if we have products, remember, divided by reactants equals K in their concentrations. If the value we get when we divide is greater than 1, we have a lot of products. And that's what that means. Um, and that usually means that the reaction usually occurs uh, and goes to completion 100%. A very small value of K means that the system is at equilibrium, but it consists mostly of reactants, and so the reaction lies to the left. And the reaction does not occur to any significant extent. So things that, for example, do not ionize well, weak acids. Uh, they do not ionize well, and therefore the, re the equilibrium tends to lie to the left. This is an example of that. All right, so if the equilibrium lies to the right, the value for K is, what do you think? If it lies to the right, K is what? And if the equilibrium lies to the left, the value for K is what? And obviously if it lies to the right, that means you're going to produce a lot of products, and the value of K is large. If it lies to the left, the value of K is small, and it is less than 1. Therefore, it doesn't, doesn't produce products easily. Now, we have also done some problems, which we'll do in our next little unit, about quotient, reaction quotient. So, we will use our mass action expression using the initial concentrations to compare it to the value of K and sometimes it equals K and sometimes it does not. So, however, if the value we get when we plug in to the mass action expression is equal to K, we're very happy, we jump up and down, we say the system is at equilibrium, yay for us, and no shifting will occur as a result of that because you're already there. It's kind of like you're in the car, and your parents say, are we there yet? Yeah, and they say yes, then you don't keep driving. Same kind of thing here. So if you're at equilibrium, it's over, and no shifting will happen. However, if the value you have is actually larger than you need, the system shifts to the left. That means you produce too many products, and you have to shift to the left to produce more reactants to make the value of K equal to Q. So consuming products and forming reactants until equilibrium is achieved. 
However, sometimes you're not there yet. In other words, the value of k is bigger than the value you have, which is q. So the reaction has to continue to shift to the right, um, consuming reactants and forming products to reach equilibrium.